Corporate Finance Presentation, Preferred Stock Valuation. Get ready, it's time to take your chance with Corporate Finance. Preferred Stock Valuation. Remember that when we're thinking about valuation, we're thinking about the present valuing of future cash flows related to the financial asset, this being preferred stock as compared to the common stock. The preferred stock not having the same type of voting rights as the common stock, but typically having the dividends to be paid first to the preferred stock. Therefore, the dividends can typically be thought of as more standardized. The thing, if we compare and contrast the preferred stock compared to the dividends that we have talked about before, the dividends have a set maturity date and they have two kinds of cash flows typically being then the cash flows related to the interest payments in terms of an annuity type of calculation and then the valuation of the face amount at maturity present value of one type of calculation with regard to the preferred stock then we can kind of think of it as dividends that go perpetually out into the future so it's a little bit more standardized in that we have these set dividends that we can say are somewhat standard for the most part but then we don't have this maturity date the end point which makes things a little bit more confusing when we do our valuation so it generally represents fixed dividend payments when we're talking about the preferred stock valuation because of the nature of the preferred stock we're typically thinking about the dividends dividends being somewhat consistent as compared to the common stock where we could have situations where if the company is growing they may have fluctuating dividends they may for example be increasing the dividends as as the changes in the company valuation happens in in terms of their life of the company of the organization has a higher claim to distributions or dividends so the preferred stock the benefit of the preferred stock typically being that they're going to get paid first on the dividends which makes then the dividends much more likely to be going out to the preferred stock usually most of the time you have to pay the preferred stock before the common stockholders get any of the dividends that's what makes them preferred however they don't have the same kind of voting rights so they don't have the same type of valuation in terms of what would be thought of as kind of ownership of the organization because they don't have the same kind of voting rights typically so no maturity date this is the thing that's going to be a little bit more complex the these are a little are simpler when we think of preferred stock than valuing the common stock because with the common stock we could have a lot more fluctuation within the dividends and we also have the valuation of of the company that we can basically try to consider in multiple different ways with the preferred stock we have a more stable dividend that we could say is going to be a more stable item most likely but we still don't have that end point the preferred stock in theory would be keeping going basically forever so how do we present value the future cash flows when we're talking about a series of payments which in theory can basically go on forever because the life of the organization if formed as a company can basically go on forever so it does not include ownership characteristics as does the common stock generally no voting rights so that's kind of the downside of the preferred stock you get paid first but then of course you only get paid as much as is going to be declared on the preferred stock and then anything over that would typically go to the common stockholders and you don't have the same kind of voting rights as the common stockholders that's the general construction some of these could vary a, a little bit depending on the circumstances so in the event of liquidation the preferred stockholder claims on assets may be larger than the common stockholder but less than the bondholders upon liquidation if the company was to close and liquidate then the question is well who gets what with regards to the financial assets then typically the bondholders have the the best position there and then you, it goes to the preferred stockholders and then to the common stockholders unless the government gets in there and messes things up in, in some different type of way but that's going to be basically the general kind of rule preferred stock valuation how do we value then the preferred stock what's the calculation to get to the value of the preferred stock now because the dividend payments are indefinite in theory it can be difficult to present value future payments so remember what our obligation here or what our idea is when we get to the valuation we think about future cash flow payments and then present value those payments using our present value concepts and a required rate of return or discount rate to get then to the value at this point in time now the bonds had some difficulties to do that when we thought about the bonds because they have a series of payments and then that face amount at the end kind of like that balloon payment type of thing so we had to present value an annuity and then present value basically that payment at the end the face amount at maturity 
Here, however, in theory, the corporation, because it's a corporation, can live basically forever. You know, right? People, the owners of the corporation could die and whatnot. They could pass it on and what so the, the corporation can keep on going. And therefore, the preferred stock, in theory, can go on. So what happens here when we're talking about the valuation of future cash flows when the cash flows can basically be indefinite? You could think of like a type of equation where we're trying to figure out future cash flows and present value indefinitely into the into the future. Now we can do we can't put together a mathematical formula and try to think about that in indefinite flow of payments. They're all the same amount, but we don't have that maturity point, that end point. We can basically have a, a simplified kind of formula down here, which is one will be more kind of applicable. That's going to be the formula below provides a a usable estimate, and so the price or valuation then we're going to calculate as the annual dividend divided divided by the required rate of return. The required rate of return, remember, is that discount rate. So that's the discount rate, kind of like the market rate that uh, we have. So we'll take the annual dividend divided by the required rate of return or discount rate. So the preferred stock valuation, we have the price equals the annual dividend divided by the required rate of return, otherwise known as the discount rate. When required rate of return changes, the value also changes. So obviously, over time, the required rate of return will change when you issue the preferred stock or when the preferred stocks are issued you would think that the issue price then would be trying to match the market in order to sell on the market and therefore you would have the required rate of return at that time but over time the required rate of return can change when it does because the preferred stock dividend is uh, infinite in theory so it goes on forever changes in required rate of return can have a large impact on value so, and that's because larger investment periods generally result in larger impact of change in required rate of return. So, in other words, we saw this kind of in the bonds. When we talked about the bonds, we talked about different maturities. You could have a bond with a maturity date that's pretty close, like a five-year bond that's going to mature in five years versus a 10-year bond, a 20-year bond, a 30-year bond. If you have the longer rate, longer bond towards maturity, meaning like a 30-year bond, then the changes in the market rate or the required rate of return can have a bigger impact on value. So now we're talking about a situation where there is no end date to maturity. So that's basically as long as you can get. That's like not the 30 year bond. We're going out indefinitely. So we have, you know, the maximum kind of impact that that impact can have on the preferred stock due to the fact the maturity date in theory there is no end point. It keeps on going and therefore changes in the required rate of return or discount rate could have a, a large impact on the price or valuation.